Okay, I want to acknowledge my friends that are here. Well, I have several friends, but uh, a couple in particular. So you heard my testimony about how God is reviving me. And it was through a book by E.M. Bounds on prayer. And the couple that took us golfing that day and handed me that book are here with us today. So Mark and Nancy, thank you. Thank you for being faithful and obedient to the Lord. It has changed my life. Praise the Lord. Okay. Lord God, I ask that you would just help me through this, Lord. This is a tough sermon, but I ask that your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts, Lord God. Graft me firmly into the vine, which is Jesus Christ. I know that I can do nothing apart from you and your Holy Spirit flowing through me, Lord. So we ask that you would... Um, just touch me and help me to speak your words and give us ears to hear, Lord, what the Spirit would say to the church today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I would like to start this morning by taking you to one of, one of, if not the single saddest verse in the Bible, and is found in John chapter 6. The context is that Jesus had fed the 5,000 And the multitudes follow him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee because they thought it was amazing how Jesus fed all of them with a little boy's lunch. And they are thinking, we don't have to labor anymore for food. Because Jesus can feed us. He can create food out of just something very tiny. And so they're seeking after Jesus because they want to continue to have full tummies. Jesus attempted to instruct them in the multitude and the multitude about real food, spiritual food, instead of physical food. But unfortunately, his followers were unable to get their minds off of the physical, and they became grossly offended. Which brings us to the saddest verse in the Bible, and ironically, it is chapter 6, verse 66. John 6, 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. The reason I take you to this scripture is because I'm sure that there will be people, some of you in this room, who will become very uncomfortable today to the point that you may want to walk out of the service. I want to encourage you right now to not turn back but to press in deeper remember in verse 67 jesus turns to the 12 the 12 disciples and he asks if they want to leave if they want to leave also and peter gives that answer that beautiful answer that reverberates through eternity through the ages then simon peter answered him lord to whom shall we go And thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So friends, please stick it out. Let the Holy Holy Ghost do what he was sent to do. In John 16, 8 it says, And when he is come, the, the Holy Spirit, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. With that little pre-warning, let's get into the meat of the sermon. For over a year now, I have been talking or taking you through one of the most amazing miracles of the Old Testament. And the subsequent revival, which really took place in one hour, when God sent fire from heaven to devour the sacrifice on the altar. This great move of God took place at the request and prayer of the prophet Elijah. So dramatic and instantaneous was the change of the heart of the children of Israel. It's described in 1 Kings 18, starting in verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, the wood the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Remember, they poured water. Elijah said, cover it with water and fill up that trench. 
and it licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all of the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, they used his holy name, Jehovah or Yahweh, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. If that was not amazing enough, Elijah tells King Ahab to go have a feast and celebrate because there is the sound of abundance of rain. Then Elijah casts himself down upon the earth, puts his face between his knees, and prays seven times, asking God to, to end the three and one half year drought where there had been no rain or dew. Of course, God mightily answers his servant's prayer and sends a great abundance of rain, and the earth brought forth its fruit. As I have said in previous sermons, I can see numerous parallels between the Israelites of Elijah's day and the U.S. today. We have not experienced any sort of physical drought that compares with the three and a half years the Israelites suffered through. But we have been subject to a dreadful and devastating spiritual drought that can only be remedied, remedied by a vast outpouring of God's Holy Spirit with accompanying conviction and true repentance starting in the church, the bride of Christ. I will say again, <clears throat> revival of God's church in America and the world for that matter is our only hope. No political movement or technological advances can fix the deep malady of the soul that is destroying our nation. More laws, more social programs, more technology, more education, more government, more cooperation between nations, less division, less racism, fewer guns or more guns, less carbon, none of these will have any effect on the souls of everyday Americans. In fact, the pandemic of lawlessness and godlessness will only get increasingly worse despite the best efforts of man. Only God can turn this around. Only God can turn this around. Church, the mega movement cannot save us. Donald Trump is not our savior. And when certain people compare him to Christ by writing books called The Return or Call for the Second Coming of Trump, I shudder in fear for our nation. Please do not take me wrong. I believe it is incumbent upon every Christian to participate vigorously in the political system in order to vehemently oppose wickedness and lawlessness on every possible front. However, when we are taking those important measures, we are dealing with the symptoms, as with the testimony we just heard, we are dealing with the symptoms of a much deeper spiritual problem. We are fighting the battle in the physical realm, which we must do, but the real victory will come in the spiritual realm when we cry out to God for true revival in the church and in our nation. God will not even consider such a mighty miracle unless his people call on his name and humble themselves and truly pray. Let's imagine for a moment that God in his anger at godless America pronounces judgment as he did when the Hebrews worshipped the golden calf. Exodus 32.10. This is God speaking. Now therefore let me alone. Leave me alone. That my wrath may wax hot against them. And that I may consume them and, make, and will make of thee a great nation. I'll wipe them out and I'll make a nation out of you, Moses. God spoke this word directly to his servant Moses. Yet Moses refused to retreat as he pressed God to hold back his wrath and have mercy on his chosen people. God listened to Moses and spared the Israelites. 
We as the church must do the same for America. We must not shrink back in lazy resignation, but instead we must stir ourselves up to lay hold of God. Isaiah 64, 7. And there is none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth himself up to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. In this verse, is this verse true of us today? Is there none? No, not one, not a single soul that has the courage and the faith to stir himself up, to lay hold of Almighty God. Is there anyone in this vast, beautiful land that is willing to be purged with the coal from the altar of God and say, here I am, Lord, send me. We dare to believe here at the altar church there is more than one. And in fact, we believe our merciful and gracious God is raising up a vast army of saints. But first, we must be purged of our iniquities. So let's return to our text in 1 Kings 19, starting in verse 1. And we'll read through 3. And Ahab told Jezebel, so this is right after the great miracles on Mount Carmel. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. These are the false prophets of Baal and Asherah. Then Jezebel sent a message unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw the message, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. It's very important that we clearly understand what we just read. This mighty faith-filled prophet of God has just called down fire from heaven and through his faithful prayers ended a 42-month drought. Yet when this woman Jezebel threatens him, he runs for his life. Why on earth would Elijah do that? He has Almighty God, the maker of heaven and earth, on his side, yet he is scared, spitless, and runs for his life. Because this woman Jezebel, the foreign wife of King Ahab, says she is going to kill him. Why didn't Elijah just say, good luck, come and get me, and you will end up like your 850 false prophets of Baal and Asherah? Elijah's response seems baffling to us. After he scored such a mighty victory for the Lord and his people, he even goes so far as to wish he were dead. But even more baffling <coughs> is the response of the wife of Ahab, Jezebel. Can you imagine Ahab returning to the king's palace to inform his queen of the incredible supernatural day he just experienced describing the fire from heaven and Elijah's prayer for rain and of course the slaughter of the 850 false prophets and priests you would think you would think this report would cause Jezebel to shake and tremble to the core of her being as she is confronted with the omnipotent power of the one true God and the pathetic impotency of her wicked idols. But not Jezebel. Oh no. She bows her stiff rebellious neck and issues a death threat to God's prophet. Much like Pharaoh in Egypt, her heart was as hard as stone and refused to repent 
and worship Jehovah. Who is this woman who struck fear into the heart of God's man? She is the daughter of a pagan king, a ruler over a wicked city, well known for worshiping idols. 1 Kings 16.31 says, speaking of King Ahab, And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, Jeroboam was a very wicked king, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Her marriage to Ahab was a political one, and she used the power she gained as the king's wife to promote her own agenda to the very fullest. By attempting to wipe out the prophets of God, she had killed most of them, while simultaneously funding all her false prophets. All the while, wicked Ahab did nothing to push back against his pagan wife's agenda, but instead he embraced it. Does any of this sound familiar to you? Truly, Solomon was, was correct. There is nothing new under the sun. The devil is using the same tactics today to wipe out God's church and deem it irrelevant and outdated while promoting a vast array of wicked and immoral agendas that are specifically designed to shred, and I mean literally shred, the social fabric of our nation and trample the truth into the dust of history. At the risk of being morbid, I sense we must look at this woman Jezebel a bit closer so that we are not ignorant of the spiritual forces that are at work in America today. Paul instructed the Corinthian church to be aware of what the enemy is trying to do, thereby preventing Satan from gaining an advantage over us. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, he says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Church, we are at this time, this critical time in history, we can scarce afford one ounce of ignorance. We must be aware of what the devil is up to. With that in mind, I want to look at chapter 21 of 1 Kings because it illustrates the degree of wickedness and corruption in the palace of Ahab. For the sake of time, I can't afford the luxury of reading the whole passage, but in a nutshell, Ahab tries to buy a piece of land that is a vineyard right next to the palace because he would like to turn it into a vegetable garden. Ahab approaches the owner of the property and offers to buy it or trade with him for a different vineyard. Naboth, the owner, refuses the offer because the vineyard is his family's inheritance and he doesn't want to give it up no matter what the price. Ahab is distraught over this and is moping around the palace and refusing to eat. In other words, he throws a king's tantrum. Jezebel notices Ahab's mood and when she finds out the cause, she assures Ahab that she can solve his problem. Not to worry. And Ahab does nothing to stop her. He sits back and watches her play out her wicked scheme. Jezebel sends a letter in the name of Ahab and sealed it with his royal seal to the leaders of, and men of prominence in the city of Jezreel and says, I would like you all to throw a party in honor of this man, Naboth, the owner of the vineyard. But prior to the party, hire a couple of scoundrels. The King, Ver King James Version calls them children of Belial, which is another name for the devil. Hire these scoundrels to accuse Naboth of blasphemy against the king and God. Obviously, these are corrupt evil men, as, as are the leaders of the city. 1 Kings 21, 11. And the men of the city, even the elders and the nobles were, who were in the inhabitants in this city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them. They were very obedient to Jezebel's commands. And as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. Does any of this sound familiar to you? It's going on right now all around us. 
So they did exactly as Jezebel had instructed in her letters. After Naboth was falsely accused, they drug him out and stoned him. When Jezebel was informed of the completion of her wicked scheme, <clears throat> she told Ahab that Naboth was dead and he should take possession of the coveted vineyard. Ahab happily did so until the man of God, Elijah the Tishbite, met him there and confronted the king with his sin. 1 Kings 21, starting with verse 17. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. And thou, and thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place, in the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Elijah also has a prophecy regarding Jezebel in verse 23. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. If that is not bad enough, the pro this proclamation of God extends to all of Ahab's descendants. In verse 24, Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dogs shall eat. And him that dieth in the field, shall the fowls of the air eat. Verse 25 sums up the life of Ahab. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. In chapter 22, we see that Ahab is killed in battle when a random arrow, they weren't even aiming at him, it's just a random arrow, strikes him between the joints of his armor and he bleeds to death in his chariot. His body was taken back to Samaria and he was buried there. One of his servants takes his chariot to a pool in Samaria. Verse uh, uh, 1 Kings twenty-two thirty-eight, 38. And, and one washed the chariot in the pool of Samaria and the dogs licked up his blood. And they washed his armor according unto the word of the Lord which he spake. What then became of Jezebel? For that answer, we must turn to 2 Kings 9, starting in verse 22, and then we'll jump down to 30. And, and it came to pass when Joram saw Yehu, that he said, Is it peace, Yehu? And he answered, What peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. Verse 30. And when Yehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. Listen to this. And she painted her face and tired her head. She adorned her head and looked out of a window. Down to 32. And Yehu lifted up his face to the window and said, Who's on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. And he said, Throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trod her underfoot. And when he was come in, he did eat and drink and said, Go see now this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. The man that Elijah anointed to be king of Israel, Yehu, has been commissioned by the Lord to fulfill the prophecies of Elijah. So he sets about to eliminate the descendants or posterity of Ahab. This included Ahab's widow, Jezebel. When Jezebel hears of Yehu's arrival, she does a strange thing. She paints her face and adorns her head and peeks out of the upper window. Now, I'm not sure how old Jezebel was at the time, but most scholars believe she was in her 60s. Nevertheless, when she heard Yehu was on the rampage to wipe out the household of Ahab, 
Her response was to paint herself up, adorn herself, and attempt seduction of the new king of Israel. Even in her old age, she continued in the wicked ways of her youth. Yehu describes her well in 2 Kings 9, 22. I'm repeating this, but it's worth repeating. And it came to pass when Joram saw Yehu, that he said, Is it peace, Yehu? And he answered, What peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. It is painfully obvious that despite seeing the mighty power of the one true God, Jezebel chose to continue in her wicked ways to the very end. It is also interesting to note that Yehu really didn't have to do much to defeat, defeat Jezebel. He yelled up to her window asking the question if anyone was on his side and two or three men, eunuchs, who had been emasculated or should I say removed of their manhood, by the queen, by their queen, looked out of the window, and as Yehu gave the simple and concise command to throw her down, which they promptly did. Thus the word of the Lord as given by Elijah the Tishbite was fulfilled. Jezebel did not receive a proper queen's burial, but instead, in verse 35, and they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull in the feet and the palms of her hands. Wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel. So they shall not say, this is Jezebel. There would not even be a place where people could go and say, here lies Jezebel. God's wrath and prophesied judgment against this wicked pagan queen was complete and so thorough that she would not even have a grave site where anyone could pay, in, pay her any kind of homage or remembrance. Now, we're going to fast forward to the last book in the Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here we find this name again in chapter 220. <coughs> revelation 220 through 23. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest, or tolerate, that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed. Other versions, New King James says a sick bed. And them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins, or the minds, and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. It seems so strange that this name Jezebel would appear again in Scripture, as Jesus himself is addressing the seven churches. In this case, he is talking to the church in Thyatira, and Jesus has some good things to say about this church. But four of the 12 verses address that woman Jezebel, who Jesus accuses of seducing his servants to commit a fornication. Before we go further in the study, I want to remind you about a key for unlocking scriptures, and it is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 46. I brought this attention to your attention before. But I want to reestablish this. It's like a key that you can use to unlock the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 46. How be it that was not the first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural. So it wasn't the first that came, the spiritual that came first. It was the natural, the, the physical. But that which is natural and afterward, that which is spiritual. 
This scripture can be used to unlock many mysteries throughout God's word. Because as we read about historical figures that are in the physical or natural realm, such as Ahab and Jezebel, we know that there are spiritual counterparts that are working evil in this present age. The primary purpose of this sermon is to expose those wicked forces and urgently warn the church of Satan's wily schemes because they are wreaking havoc in America and in God's church. What Jesus is warning the church about is a spiritual entity that manifests itself and even goes so far as to deceiving Christ's servants. Paul explains this phenomenon in Ephesians 6.12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. In evangelical circles, <clears throat> we refer to this particular entity as the Jezebel spirit. And over the years, the church has learned a great deal about how this spirit operates and who, in particular, it tends to prey upon. Although it can attack men and, and women alike, its primary focus is to prey upon wounded women. I will also say that to this day, this spirit strikes fear into the hearts of, of the men of God. Just as it did to Elijah centuries ago. No different today. For this reason, you will seldom hear a sermon on this topic. And I will confess, I too have experienced great trepidation. But I am convinced that in order to experience true revival, this wicked spirit must be faced dead on. As with Yehu, we must cry, throw her down. We must not tolerate this ravaging cruelty any longer. I would first like to address how most often wounding occurs. Because the wounding I speak of is not physical, necessarily, but spiritual and emotional. It is the tearing and ripping of the sentient matter of the inner person. The heart, if you will. It is the remainder of this sermon, in the remainder of this sermon, I will be talking about sensitive topics regarding, as the Bible puts it, men and women knowing each other. I will be very respectful and discreet, and my hope is that we can address issues that are vitally important to the health of our church and nation without being offensive or crude. So let's start at the beginning, when marriage was first instituted. Genesis 2.22 And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. This passage articulates the beauty and sanctity of the marriage bed and was obviously instituted by our wise and benevolent creator, Almighty God, for our good and his glory. Sadly, like everything that was declared good at creation, sin and selfishness has stained and perverted what was meant to be so wonderfully fulfilling and deeply satisfying. The primary culprit in this defilement of the marriage bed is this strange word of Latin origins, fornication. For those who do not know, fornication is any kind of intimate contact which was intended by God to be reserved for the marriage bed. Tragically, something happened in the U.S. about the time I was born. There was a massive shift in our culture, which has been labeled the sexual revolution. During this rapid decline of our nation's moral integrity, it was promoted that intimacy was not to be confined to the marriage bed any longer, 
Instead, it was to be used as a recreational activity to be engaged in regularly and with numerous partners strictly for the fleshly indulgence of the participants. The spiritual and emotional aspects were vehemently denied and ignored while whole generations were ripped apart and internally scarred to the point of rendering many incapable of participating in, healthy, in a healthy, godly marriage. For years now, I've used a very simple illustration to help us to understand what recreational intimacy does to the inner person. With that, I'm going to employ some advanced technology, something called a whiteboard. Boom. I knew you'd be impressed with that. <laughs> That's my little simple diagram. Several years ago, I was pondering the concept of the two becoming one flesh. And I was asking the Lord, what happens to the spirits or the, the hearts of two people who make those unbreakable promises of holy matrimony and then consummate their marriage by becoming one flesh on their wedding night? I believe the best way to describe it is that their spirits overlap. Just like that little illustration, they overlap. They become connected in a deep spiritual way. Become deeply connected in, the, in their inner beings in a way that is far more intimate and meaningful than the physical uniting. So this is my illustration. And Jesus said, when this union happens, when the two come together as one flesh, that God is a part of that union. Making it not just a physical act of the will of man, but a spiritual union in which God unites the two as husband and wife. Jesus made this extremely clear when he stated in Matthew 19, 4 through 6. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife. And they twain, the two, shall become one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. When we consider this little illustration, we can see why Jesus would make such a definitive statement about the joining together of husband and wife. Listen carefully. You see, this heart matter, this substance of the heart, is not like our flesh. It does not naturally heal on its own. The spiritual substance is at the core of one's being and has spiritual nerves that feel anguish at a plane of sensitivity that is far beyond the physical realm. God intended from the beginning that this union only happen once and last for a lifetime. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. This biblical truth, right from the mouth of the Savior, begs the question, what happens if man does put this union asunder? Well, in fact, we see the consequences of this grave sin all around us. To go back to our technologically advanced whiteboard, we can illustrate when the two are rent asunder, there is great spiritual and emotional damage that is done to the very core of one's being. Damage that does not go away, but is carried directly into the next relationship. And even even attracted to persons who will readily inflict, in, inflict more and increasingly damaging soul abuse. So they're drawn to people that will do the same thing to them. So 
This is a simple illustration, but when someone has recreational intimacy and then they break up, there's a tearing of this sentient material that we're referring to as their hearts. There's a ripping apart. They're not, they're not one, the flesh is one, but there's this overlapping and connection. In the ranches, they call it soul ties. But there's a connection there that is spiritual and emotional and deep within your soul. And when that tearing occurs, it does great damage, it does grave damage. In our society today, that's allowed to happen over and over and over and actually encouraged. We're, we're encouraged to have multiple, um, multiple partners and not to, not to settle on one, but shop around, look around for a long time. And what that does is it, it damages us so badly that when we do finally want to say, you know, I think I do want to get married, we're so damaged we, we can't even we don't even know how to love anymore. It's just so sad and, and tragic. The pain and damage that is caused by this kind of activity is so devastating to the soul that Jesus gave an exception for allowing divorce if there had been physical unfaithfulness because he understood very well how painful and damaging the tearing apart due to adultery was and mercifully allowed this as a scriptural justification for divorce. Just for the record, we at the altar, in such instances, still promote reconciliation and healing. If the offended spouse is willing to forgive, but with the understanding that scripturally the offended spouse has every right to depart from the marriage. The only other scriptural justification for divorce was given to us by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, that if a person is married to an unbeliever and they want out of the marriage, Paul writes in verse 15, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. Now that we can clearly see from this little illustration and from Scripture, more importantly, from Scripture, how damaging it is to have recreational intimacy. It is no wonder that there are so many women and men who are easy prey for the one who seeks to devour us like a roaring lion. And he will not hesitate one minute to call in his most hideous of minions, the Jezebel spirit. This spirit deceives the wounded person into believing that in order to survive and not be ravaged further, they must take control of their lives and not trust anyone, including God. They must somehow get to positions of power and influence to guard themselves from further pain and to rid themselves of any dependence. They become unable to trust and unable to submit because the person they may be close to might do something to jeopardize or harm them. The answer, fear is a big factor, by the way. The answer in their eyes is to take control, for only they can be trusted. They must take control. Just like Jezebel of old, manipulation and passive aggression become useful tools in one's quest for protection and self-preservation. In other words, the wounded soul becomes the opposite of what God deems precious. 1 Peter 3, verse 1 through 7. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of their wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold, of putting on fine apparel, but let it be the hidden man, the hidden person of the heart. 
in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. That weak and that meek, excuse me, that meek and quiet spirit is so precious in the sight of God. For after this manner in old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Or terror would be a good word to put in there, amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. In my experience, a person who has succumbed to the Jezebel spirit has great difficulty submitting the Jezebel spirit is a seductive spirit that preys upon women who have been badly injured. And then it seeks out men of God or leaders and men of influence like Ahab to be yoked to. It desires to be in charge. And then the Revelation passage, it says she calls herself a prophetess, which indicates she is drawn to spirituality and covets power and position in the church or religious circles. Brothers and sisters, in my years of counseling, I've encountered many, many people who claim their fornicating lifestyle did not harm them at all and that they feel no conviction for continuing in it. And yet many fall into dreadful addictions in attempts to sedate the inner pain. They say, I'm fine. By the way, I have to leave early. Because I have to go get a prescription for my anxiety. <laughs> Little do they know that continuing down this path of promiscuity leads to a heart that is so calloused and wounded that it becomes stony and hard to the point of developing an inability to love properly and affectionately. Even if they do find a spouse that will patiently nurture them. It becomes a crippling handicap to any sort of healthy relationship. Okay, men, you're up. We are primarily responsible for this condition in our country. We may not hurt as badly as women hurt, but fornication damages us. And we have to consider the damage we're doing to these young women. We should be weeping and weeping over this sin. Over time, this damage turns us into abusive women haters, unwilling to make the sacrifices and commitment necessary to be good husbands or fathers. Today, men are opting out of marriage altogether Many may father numerous children from different women, but are unwilling to man up and marry any of them. Young men today are very hesitant to step into manhood. They prefer to languish in adolescence and have little or no motivation to take on the responsibilities of marriage and fatherhood. They seem quite content to nurture a laid-back lifestyle, lifestyle consisting of constant streams of entertainment and self-indulgence. The biblical concept of self-denial and laying down one's life or self-interest for the benefit of a wife and family are becoming increasingly rare. It is important that the church be keenly aware that the sin of fornication has become an acceptable sin in the church. It is perceived as not as bad as other sins. And so we brush it under the rug and we concentrate on the more egregious sins, such as drug addiction or alcoholism, when in fact these addictions 
are most likely a byproduct of the inner woundedness caused by fornication. What I am describing here is a national tragedy. This is playing out before our very eyes. Much of the political and moral and economic woes of our nation stem from the, this breakdown of personal morals. The most devastating is the, the destruction of the nuclear family. Listen to this. Four of ten children were born to unwed mothers. But when this is broken down into demographics, it is even more shocking because the minority communities are, are hit far worse. The black community is 72%. Hispanics, 53%. And Native Americans, 63%. 66% of the children are born to unwed mothers. When one extrapolates those percentages to the next generation, the numbers increase exponentially since children raised in, sing in single-parent families do far worse in every metric. They do poorer in school. They are far less likely to go to college. <clears throat> they are more likely to be incarcerated, live in poverty, struggle with addictions, and have children out of wedlock themselves. One does not have to be a statistician to realize social, societal implosion is inevitable if God has not mercy on us. A sweeping revival across our nation is our only hope, and it starts right here in our own hearts. As I stated at the beginning, the church in America should fight against the ills of society on every possible front, through righteous political, economic, and legislative action. But the root of the problem, the source of the problem, can only be changed one soul at a time. The reversal of Roe v. Wade was a huge victory for the church. But the ultimate solution is to never have an unwanted pregnancy. Never have a woman trapped in the desperation of sinful life patterns, feeling as though her only option is to snuff out the life of her child. This is where the church of God must shine the brightest in those dark crevices of despair. In closing... It is my prayer that the Lord will allow me to administer some healing balm. As I was reflecting on the sins of Ahab, I couldn't help but compare his sin with that of King David's. Ahab lusted after a vineyard. David lusted after another man's wife. Ahab allowed his wife to manipulate and connive the situation so as to secure the vineyard. David used his kingly power over Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, to cover his sin and secure his death. Ahab allowed his wife to falsely accuse an innocent man and have him murder, murdered. Their sins were very similar, but David found favor with God and was called a man after God's own heart, while Ahab died in disgrace as an enemy of God and the people he ruled. What was the difference between these two men? I think the answer is found in Psalm 51, where King David expresses godly sorrow that leads to repentance. In Revelation 2, it says, And I gave her space to repent <coughs> of her fornication, and she repented not. The Jezebel spirit will never repent, and she repented not. Nor did Ahab's wife, but a wounded person, a wounded person who has fallen under the influence of this deceiving spirit, can and should immediately repent. Many here have been wounded by no fault of their own. 
You were victimized and yet are suffering the same consequences. And I am here to tell you that Jesus suffered with you. When you were weeping in the darkness, alone and broken, he was there catching your tears and weeping alongside you. Jesus suffered. He suffered with you and for you on the cross. And he stands now at the door knocking with the healing balm of Gilead in his hands. He is the only one who can heal your heart. He's the only one that can repair the damage. There is no medical procedure to heal the pain that you feel deep inside. There is no pill you can take. They only cover it up for a season. A new spouse is no remedy. The only answer is true repentance and allowing Jesus and his Holy Spirit to touch you deep in your inner being and heal the damage that you have hidden for all oh, these many years. Resurrection Sunday is coming up. I want to close with Isaiah 53, 4 through 5. I don't know about you, but whenever I read Isaiah 53, I just can't hardly hold it together. Surely he has borne our griefs. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Hallelujah. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we thank you and praise you that you do not leave us in this desperate state, Lord. You paid the price on that cross so many years ago. That fount of Calvary flows today for sinner and saint alike. Lord, help us to dive into that fount, Lord, and be cleansed. If we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We claim that today, Lord. Wash us clean by your precious blood. Lord, not only did you wash us clean, but you purchased for us the abundant life, the abundant life. Lord, I pray that you would teach us in the, the altar church how to live the abundant life, how to abide in Christ, how to live the supernatural life, to not be bound in the grave clothes that have held us back for so long, Lord, but to be set free to serve you, Lord, as you called us to, to be free, Lord, to be holy as thou art holy. Lord, purge us today. Lord, we say in the altar church, we are not going to tolerate fornication. We are going to preach against it until your Holy Spirit purifies your bride. Lord, you're coming for a bride that is without spot or wrinkle. Lord, we're far from that today, but we want to be cleansed. We want to be free of spot or wrinkle. We want to be that bride that Pastor Tim envisioned in his dream. That was so beautiful and protected by the, the rivers of living water. Lord God, we thank you for this time. Pray that you would convict our hearts, Lord. Heal those that need healing, Lord. Heal those that need healing, Lord. Apply the balm of Gilead right now, Lord. Touch those souls that are hurting, Lord, and crying out to you right now, Lord. Do a mighty work. Lord, we pray your Holy Spirit would sweep across this place. 
bring conviction, Lord. We thank you in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus. Amen.